Hey guys, Level Cap here, and today I'm going to be reviewing the Star Wars Squadrons single player campaign, which just came out. Now, Squadrons also has a multiplayer component that's actually quite robust in terms of loadout, skill, and strategy, and in fact has been one of the more marketed aspects of the game. But today's video is just going to be about the story mode component. And there will be a few plot spoilers way later in the video, but I'll be sure to warn you before I get into any of that. Also, a shout out to the EA Game Changers program for hooking me up with a key a day before launch. Now, it's been quite a while since Star Wars fans have gotten a specifically spaceship focused video game. In the 90s, there was a series of X-Wing and TIE Fighter games that delivered a space sim-like experience. Then there were the Rebels Rogue Squadron games that followed the Rebels Rogue Squadron around on various missions. But since then, the only X-Wing or TIE Fighter combat we've received has been tagged onto bigger game packages like Star Wars Battlefront, both the original and remakes. And although the flight experience in those games was fun, it certainly wasn't super deep or engaging. Both the Battlefront remakes did offer some very pretty looking visuals. In fact, Battlefront 2's space combat is a considerable step beyond the first game, but the single player missions that were tied into flying spaceships were very, very basic in terms of controls and the skill ceiling. It mostly just looked really pretty and made you feel like an X-Wing or a TIE Fighter pilot for a short period of time. But here we are now with a dedicated space combat game in the Star Wars universe, and I am so happy that EA took a chance on a game like this. It's clear that the developers created this game with the intention of a high degree of mastery involved. It's actually a really hard game, similar to, say, Jedi Fallen Order if you're going to play it on the higher difficulty levels. And just like Jedi Fallen Order, this game does also have the option of enabling story mode difficulty, aka easy mode, if you're really struggling to beat some missions, as you will without a doubt die quite a lot on any of the higher level difficulties. There is a lot to learn in squadrons from balancing your power, figuring out optimal turn speeds, drifting your fighter, focusing frontal and rear shields, using countermeasures, dodging missiles when you don't have any countermeasures left, operating your complex targeting system, and using many different weapon types to counter certain enemies. Fortunately though, the game doesn't just throw all of this at you at once, and it does train you on more advanced controls from mission to mission. Now, I will say that although you can play this game with a keyboard and mouse or even a joystick as I initially plugged in my Thrustmaster Warthog, the key bindings for anything but a controller were, in my opinion, not very good. In fact, as I struggled to learn to fly with my Warthog, it became apparent that doing certain things like balancing my shield power really wasn't actually possible with the default key binding, as it basically required my thumb to be in two different places at once. Now, I'm not saying that you can't properly map a joystick for this game, but you basically need to learn to play the game before you know what a good mapping setup would be. I definitely wasn't happy that the joystick profiles in the game seemed to be lacking so much, but once I switched over to an Xbox Elite controller, I totally forgot about my joystick. The game was definitely designed to be played with a controller. So if you're thinking about binding your HOTAS for a super immersive experience, I'm not saying that you can't, but it's probably going to take a lot of work just to be able to compete with what a basic controller setup can already do. Now, speaking of immersive experience, this game does offer full VR support, which is absolutely awesome. I, however, did not play in VR, but I would like to dabble in it a little bit in short stints. One of the reasons I chose to just fly it on a normal screen was that I knew the campaign was going to be around seven to eight hours, and wearing a VR headset for that long is a bit daunting for me. Also, I've played the Battlefront X-Wing VR experience, and it was awesome, but again, in a more bite-sized chunk. That being said, from what I hear and have seen, the gameplay looks absolutely awesome in VR, but I don't think it's a necessary addition to enjoy the game. It's probably just that extra bit for the experience of somebody who really wants to feel like they're inside the cockpit of an X-Wing. I'm not sure how well that translates once you're in a TIE Fighter cockpit, since you can still only look at a porthole in front of you, 
but uh, that's something that I'll have to test out in the future. Now, as a byproduct of being designed around the VR experience, there's also no external camera in the game, so you're always looking out of your ship's cockpit, and that's actually really cool, because for the most part, an external camera will give you an advantage in things like multiplayer, and just forcing everybody to be first person in the cockpit is a nice change of pace for these types of games. It also really indicates that the devs were going for a much more hardcore experience right off the bat. Now, just like the Star Wars Battlefront games, Squadrons does run on the Frostbite engine. However, it became clear to me early on that even when running the game on maximum graphic settings, the visuals were just not as impressive as I remember them being in Battlefront 2. Especially because in Battlefront 2, you are actually fighting around the same type of space stations and the same type of ships from inside the X-Wing cockpit. But looking at the two games side by side, it's clear that Battlefront 2 is the winner when it comes to just lighting and fidelity. Now, I believe Motive, the studio that made this game, got probably a lot of assets from the Battlefront dev team, but they must have toned down the lighting engine so that it could run smoothly on VR. And that being said, not once did the game dip in frame rate, and I was able to keep it at a solid 144 FPS at 1440p resolution on a 2080 Ti video card. But there was definitely a part of me wishing for that extra level of visual fidelity that I knew was possible with the Frostbite engine. Nonetheless, it didn't distract me for long as you're quickly thrown into capital class fleet battles taking on Gazanti class cruisers, escort carriers, and star destroyers. Actually, a really cool thing this game does is if you're at all a fan of the animated Star Wars TV shows or video games, it incorporates a lot of the ships from that lore and throws it into the fleet battles. And it really makes the Imperial fleet look more realistic when you have a few smaller support ships filling in various roles throughout the battlefield instead of just seeing nothing but Star Destroyers. Also, each of the larger ships have their own subsystems so you can disable stuff like turrets and things to reduce their firepower power before actually delivering the finishing blow. Now the campaign for this game could be seen as a tutorial for multiplayer in that it walks you through all the controls and the various ship types so that by the time you're done with it you should at least have some idea of what you're doing in your first multiplayer match. But the campaign itself is actually a decent standalone experience, so much so that I would absolutely want more missions and content for it if Motive plans on doing DLC. The game has some truly epic cutscenes and also you should really watch the Hunted trailer before playing because it's just some of the best Star Wars action you will see probably anywhere. Interestingly, the campaign has you play from both sides of the conflict between the Empire and the Rebellion in the aftermath of the Emperor's death. Even after the Emperor's death, the Empire still had a massive fleet and many more battles were fought, which is also the same time period that the Battlefront 2 campaign explored, though they focused more on the events surrounding and leading up to the Battle of Jakku. This game has a slightly more separate plot and sort of switches the roles of the Empire, having to hunt down a secret project of the Rebellion, or I guess the New Republic in this case. And before I get into the plot spoilers for those of you planning on playing it yourself and want to be surprised by some of the things that happen, I do want to give a basic overview just so you can be left with that. This game is good, and that's even before testing it out in the VR experience. Really, my only knocks against the single player aspect of the game are against the graphics being held back by VR and some not great facial animations and weird monologue timing of the NPCs. Unfortunately, a lot of the side character stories are a bit boring and most of the time you just want to skip them, but the core story and characters are a bit more interesting. So if you've got $40 burning a hole in your pocket or you're subscribed to EA Play Pro, then this is a no brainer. Play it, enjoy it, and ask the devs for more story content. I'll take 20 more missions, please. Okay, now we're moving on to some of the plot spoilers, so if you don't want to know what's going to happen in this game, stop watching now. Now story-wise, the game pulls out a couple of iconic characters like Wedge and Tilly's and Hera, which is kind of cool seeing them in the game, but for the most part they don't really play a super iconic role. The more interesting character is Linden, who used to fly for the Empire but decided to defect 
once he realized that they were needlessly murdering civilians. He manages to work his way up to the high command of the New Republic and is put in charge of developing a new super weapon ship to help finish off the capital fleet of the Empire. Now this super weapon ship that he's built has some sort of super tractor beam, which I guess is useful for pushing a ship into say an asteroid or something like that. But outside of ramming ships into other ships, it's a little confusing as to why this is an ultimate weapon. But whatever, the Rebels or Republic don't really have a lot of experience in this whole super weapon development department. Now the story switches from the Republic perspective to the Empire's perspective periodically, and it's nice to see the Empire written in a less ridiculous way. The pilots themselves aren't too over the top and evil, though the game doesn't really get too deep into the morality or philosophy of the conflict, which is fine. In my opinion, Star Wars doesn't really have the room for that kind of depth, since the Empire seems to just do ridiculously horrible things all the time, so trying to justify it is hard without making all their supporters complete monsters. So if you're willing to glaze over motives and realistic character writing a little bit, it's a fun ride. I particularly like the TIE pilot in your squadron who never takes off his battle damaged helmet because apparently his many injuries have turned him into some sort of Vader looking freak underneath. Definitely one of the cooler character ideas in my opinion. Now again, I just want to reiterate that you shouldn't be expecting the depth or character writing that you would get with a game like, say, Jedi Fallen Order. This game just doesn't get that deep. At all. Most of the character development is optional, and I chose to avoid a lot of it because for whatever reason there are these awkward pauses between lines of dialogue as if I'm supposed to fill them in with like, uh-huh, right, right, sure. Ah, okay, okay. Like, I'm not really sure why that's a thing, but it really turned me off to listening to the characters' backstories because there was just these awkward pausing moments that just killed any sort of natural dialogue or rather monologue in this case. Now, personally, I was hoping the story was going to get way more interesting and that they were going to make Linden into a double defector and that his plan was to pretend to defect the whole time just to get into the high command of the New Republic so he could really screw them over in some sort of epic way. But uh, the plot, unfortunately, does suffer a bit from predictability and nonsense plot points. Like toward the end of the game, you need to fly into this mega ship to disable it, which is kind of like flying into the Death Star. But upon disabling it, not much really happens anyway. So it was just sort of like the devs wanted a Death Star like sequence without having a Death Star. Also, this big super weapon ship is supposed to be so powerful, but it quite literally does nothing to prove its combat abilities other than like damage one Star Destroyer, which is then able to hyperspace away. So although we're supposed to believe that this super weapon is actually super, it's never really explained why it's just so darn dangerous. Also, the last mission is like totally absurd as the plot is to fly your damaged super weapon ship into a small moon or asteroid causing it to explode which will then kill the enemy fleet or something like that and so you're protecting this ship as it slowly accelerates towards an asteroid for like 10 minutes as you fight off the empire and even though the empire should have clearly seen this plan coming a mile away as it's very obvious and they clearly know that you're accelerating the ship in a certain direction they don't really move out of the way, even though they're perfectly capable of doing so. And so there's just plenty of nonsense plot points along the way. I certainly didn't come into the game expecting a Jedi Fallen Order narrative since the game is certainly lesser priced and marketed mostly for its multiplayer experience. So considering that the single player is actually quite fun and at least they made an effort with the story and characters, I am... Um, impressed. It's definitely a game a lot of old Star Wars fanboys are going to be excited for. Now they just really need more missions or perhaps mod tools to let the community start making even more content for it. The platform's great. I'm imagining the VR aspect of it is going to offer a lot of other cool stuff too once I start to test that out. As always guys, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this review. If you did, don't forget to leave a like below. Let me know in the comments if you are playing this game and what you think about it. 
And I'll see you guys next time. This is Level Cap signing off.